Hello and welcome again. The IB chemistry exam for May 2024. It's happening in just over 10 days from today. On Wednesday, the 8th of May, in the afternoon, students, HL and SL, you'll be taking paper one and paper three on that afternoon. Here you can see the breakdown of what paper one and paper three looks like, of course. Paper one, your multiple choice, spanning the entire of the core syllabus. Paper three, which includes your options. You have to answer all questions on a single option in section B. And then of course, in section A, you likely will have two questions in HL, those two questions will account for 15 marks. In SL, those two questions will account for 15 marks. And they are going to be based on something experimental likely, possibly an experiment like the empirical formula of magnesium oxide or water of crystallization in copper sulfate or the use of a colorimeter or possibly the molar volume of a gas with a lighter below water and collecting the gas. Those types of questions have come in the past in section A of paper three. Be prepared for things that deal with error propagation, significant figures, and sometimes the answers in section A of paper three are sitting in plain sight. They're very easy, or they might, in question one especially, be extracted from data that is given to you. And then of course, paper three, section B, deals with your option. That you could sit down in the morning when you have the time. Most students are, are free in the morning with history, the only exam scheduled at that time. And you could study your entire option. It's like studying for a big unit test, you see. And especially in chemistry, you must pay attention to quantitative items. There are a couple types of problems that always appear depending upon whichever option you choose. Likely there might be things to just deal with some application of stoichiometry or in the case of option D and option C, half-life or the application of the henderson hasselbach equation like in option B and in option D. So please be prepared for your simple problems. Then you can do a bit of rote memorization in the morning for paper three. But your studies for paper one and two, they need to be ongoing, they need to be happening right now in the days leading up to the exam. You need to be reviewing several important topics. All topics in the core syllabus need to be mastered for top grades. What are these topics and how can you remind yourself of them? If you've never heard of the IB Chemistry Guide for first exams in 2016, I can give you a copy of it. Just send me a mail. But if you use this document as your checklist and you just go down through all of the 21 topics for HL or all of the 11 topics for SL and look at what is required, hopefully you might find that you know half of it already or you're familiar with it. Just being familiar with what you need to know. And of course, chemistry is very quantitative and problem based. So you must practice with all kinds of written problems whether it's acids and bases or stoichiometry or kinetics. Then when it's organic chemistry, you must know your mechanisms. And when it's bonding, you must know your structures and VSEPR structures and how to draw your Lewis diagrams. With that kind of focus, you're likely going to be prepared to do a good job on the examination. But of course, on Thursday, after this exam is finished in the afternoon, you have a night of rest and don't expect to be able to do too much. Every person is different, but you can't go to now study the core syllabus in one night. So whatever work you've put in before, you need to depend upon that in case you have a moment where you just need to crash and sleep for 10 hours and get up and get out to the exam in the next morning in, uh, for paper two for SL, which is one hour, 15 minutes for SL. And it's, this is the monster paper for HL students, two hours, 15 minutes. When you go into that paper, please browse and see what you can do. Do those things first. Do not get too caught up in a question that you're stuck at. Do everything that you can solve. 
and try and see if you can find 30 marks that you own out of those 90 marks. SL, you try to find if you can own 20 marks out of those. And then it becomes a scrap for most students to try to get some more marks. 30, I say, sounds like a small number out of 90. But I'll show you the boundaries for last November's exam. And scoring 30 out of 90 or 18 out of 50 in paper two is quite a creditable performance that is likely to be sufficient to get you to pass this examination with a grade of four and above. Bearing in mind that for HL, the world average in chemistry is just around 4.4 to 4.5, and in SL it's even less. So when you think you're in the exam and you're losing this mark and that mark, even if you're aiming for a seven, a score of 70 out of 90, you might feel, oh, I lost 20 marks, but that might be sufficient. So what I'm going to do now is to go into last November's exam, scroll down and have a look at the boundaries with you, and just highlight a couple of topics that the examiners identified from last November's exam. And then I'll take a look at two for SL and two for HL. And here, like I mentioned, you can see the grade boundaries. These are the overall grade boundaries for last November's exam. And here you can see that for HL chemistry, a four is 40%. For SL chemistry, a four. 43. Not shown here, but I also checked paper 2, and in paper 2 of HL, a 4 was set at 32 out of 90, and for SL it was 22 out of 50. So like I mentioned, you have to go in there and look to see where you can get your 30 marks from to start with. Uh, in paper two, that is, I will look and see where you can get your 20 marks from in, in SL, paper two. Also, of course, you have the multiple choice, paper three and the IA. And with all of those, uh, passing grade of a four comes to 40 last November. Uh, last May, in one of the time zones, it was 39. So you can expect this year again in the May exam. Uh, a boundary of approximately 40, 41 for HL and 43 or so for SL, for a 4 that is. Of course, an SL student, 27 is a 3, which could be sufficient um, to be considered a pass at the standard level. Now, these were some of the areas of difficulty pinpointed by the examiners. I'll scroll down here, let you see them. And then you have got all of these here. So, as I promised, I'm going to review a few of those, and one is distinguishing among primary, secondary, tertiary amines. A little different from primary, secondary, tertiary alcohols and primary, secondary, and tertiary halogenoalkanes. You see, it's all about this nitrogen here. A primary amine has two hydrogens attached to that nitrogen. A secondary has one, and the other group typically is like a carbon with something else, like a CH3. doesn't have to be, but um, just one H attached to that nitrogen and two other things at the two other bonds. A tertiary amine actually has no hydrogens attached to it. So this is something that is a bit obscure and students do tend to neglect it. Of course, you also need to know about primary, secondary, tertiary alcohols and halogenoalkanes. Those are more likely actually to show up in the exam. Um, students also, especially biology students, also get a bit confused. Okay, what's the difference between an amine and an amino acid? Because they see this NH2 group in amino acids. But amino acids actually are so-called because they are primary amines. They have NH2 groups. And that is seen as a synonym for the primary amine. Then there was some mention about electrolysis in the examiner's report last November, and here I present to you some notes that could show you for the electrolysis of water. These are the reactions happening at anode and cathode. Now notice, I mentioned electrolysis of water, but then this is dilute NaCl aqueous that I have here. 
that basically amounts to the electrolysis of water. When these salts are in dilute solution, it's basically the electrolysis of water that you are carrying out. When, however, you have them in a concentrated solution here, like in the case of KBr, then you don't get the K, but you will get the hydrogen and you will get bromine if it's concentrated. So you can disregard this dilute that I have here. If, however, you have a concentrated copper chloride, in that case, you will get both uh, copper and chlorine. Copper is below hydrogen on the reactivity series. And copper chloride would yield uh, chlorine and copper. Copper sulfate, hydrogen and oxygen, uh, potassium nitrate, hydrogen and oxygen, potassium chloride, hydrogen and oxygen, if it's dilute. If it's concentrated, actually this is an error that I have here, so let's disregard this. This should be potassium because it's concentrated. If it were dilute, then you'll get hydrogen. Uh, MgBr2, you will get uh, Br2 and hydrogen because it's concentrated. Sodium chloride concentrated would give you chlorine and hydrogen. Dilute would give you oxygen and hydrogen. Potassium bromide, molten. Now, these two at the top, when things are in the molten state, of course, which means not an aqueous solution, then there's no way that you could get water and you will get potassium here and Br2, sodium and Cl2. So do take a note of what's happening at the anode and what's happening at the cathode. Do bear in mind also that this entire diagram is all about electrolysis, not about the voltaic cell. This diagram over here is all about the voltaic cell. And here you can see the negative electrode here, where Ni is losing two electrons, oxidation is loss, and oxidation always happens at the anode. And then you see here that Pb2 plus is gaining two electrons to form Pb solid, and that is reduction. Reduction always happens at the cathode, and then you have a flow this way. Something has to be oxidized and something has to be reduced. Lead is going here, the lead ions oxidation state plus two is going to oxidation state zero. It's a fall, so therefore lead is being reduced. Reduction is gain of electrons or a fall in oxidation number. Nickel is losing two electrons. Oxidation is lost and it's going from oxidation state zero here in the solid state to Ni2 plus. Oxidation always happens at the anode, and here it's the negative electrode, and, and electrons flow or push electricity from one side to the next, and ions move across the salt bridge. This, of course, is your typical voltaic cell. Lastly, I want to talk a bit about resonance structures as mentioned by the examiners. The uh, typical resonance structure, one that's actually mentioned in our chemistry guide. Ozone is another one that's mentioned. Here, the carbonate ion, CO3, 2 minus. Its true structure is actually shown here. Experimental data shows that it contains actually 1.33 carbon to oxygen bonds, meaning to say the bond length is not exactly single or double, but corresponding to a 1.33 bond length. The same for the bond enthalpy or the bond strength. It corresponds to 1.33. If you have three domains, like you have here, three bonding domains, and you have four bonds according to Vesper, like you have here, like in this diagram, then we say the bond order is 4 divided by 3, 1.33. But Vesper doesn't allow 1.33 bonds or 1.5 bonds like you have in ozone. So when that happens, we need to represent its structure in as many different ways that would satisfy VSEPR. And it so happens that the carbonate ion has three structures that satisfy the rules of valence shell electron pair repulsion. And we draw those three structures and we put double-headed arrows between them. Not to mean that 
the carbonate ion is fluctuating between three structures. No such thing. It's actually set at this structure here. So resonance is just a term that we use when VSEPR is being used to represent multiple possible structures for an atom or an ion. For an ion or for a molecule. And the carbonate ion is an example of something. And the carbonate ion is an example of an ion that exhibits resonance. And finally, good luck to everyone in this year's exams.